The world is marking 30 years since the Tiananmen Square massacre in Beijing. Chinese troops stormed student-led protests on this day back in 1989. They opened fire on pro-democracy demonstrators demanding widespread reform. It is unclear how many people were killed, but the death toll likely ranges from the hundreds to the thousands. Now China has censored all mention of the bloodshed. CBS News senior foreign correspondent Elizabeth Palmer went to Beijing and asked Chinese citizens if they had ever heard of the massacre. Minutes later, police detained her and her team for six hours. Here's a closer look. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather. Good evening. Thousands of combat troops from the People's Liberation Army now occupy Tiananmen Square in Beijing. The students are gone. They'd been there for weeks. Then on June 4th, hardliners in the Communist Party send in the army. It was a bloodbath. Hundreds, maybe thousands, were killed. Wu Er Kai Shi, then 21 and one of the main student leaders, escaped. I am a survivor of a massacre. I have to live with the guilt. He and the students knew the government was threatened by demands for reform. Real ammunition and tanks rolling over people? No way. There's you no, never no, dreamed no, it would come to no, that? No. Mm. We visited Tiananmen Square, which is now a tourist attraction under 24-7 surveillance. Every lamppost supports a cluster of cameras. And the square's been completely scrubbed of anything that might recall the events of 1989. It happened in the States. In fact, the government has so successfully written them out of history. No. No idea? That yeah. random young people we asked uh, didn't no even idea. recognize the most famous Tiananmen picture. Is in which country? Communist Party is extremely nervous about people learning the, the fact of what happened, which is people stood up and challenged the government. <laughs> to make sure they never did it again, the party introduced sweeping economic changes that transformed China into a dynamic power, but at its core, it remains an authoritarian police state. We failed miserably. Let's face it, they are exchanging our economic freedom with our political freedom. Wu Kai-shi, the young idealist, paid a personal price. You were there. He spent the next three decades in exile. I haven't been able to see my parents for the for last 30 years. Mm. I cannot go back to China, and they denied them traveling abroad. That's quite so, a price to pay. I'm heartbroken for that. And heartbroken for the reform movement, once so full of hope, now utterly crushed. And we're joined now by Tiananmen Square protester Shen Tong. He's the author of Almost a Revolution, the story of a Chinese student's journey from boyhood to leadership in Tiananmen Square. He is with us from Washington now. Uh, Mr. Shen, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I, wanna, to be here. I wanna ask you, how do you feel, what goes through your mind when you look back 30 years to what you witnessed at Tiananmen Square and to where we are now in 2019? Well, it's uh, the most meaningful, impactful, and the happiest moment uh, in, uh, in my life, short of uh, uh, the birth of my children. It was uh, different from the painful memories we have today and uh, the political winter that China still has gone through. Despite of the amazing economic development, that was uh, seven weeks before the massacre. It was seven weeks of uh, triumph of human spirit and celebration. You know, uh, many people will see China today and they'll see, you know, Apple stores and, and uh, various sort of um, indications of, of, of capitalism. Yeah. Um, but can you take us back 30 years and tell me what the mood was at the time? What tr what would the environment was like at the time that inspired these this pro-democracy movement? Well, China was uh, on the path of a great uh, development. And what you see today is a continuation of uh, economical development and uh, freedom to some extent, certainly accumulation of wealth and this bizarre state-controlled uh, capitalism, right? But 30 years ago, China was also at a crossroad, historical crossroad, in addition to economic development, 
to uh, for for political liberty and the civil liberty, for freedom, for greater freedom and uh, greater government accountability and ending of official corruption. At that time, what we call the greater democracy. So that was a pro-democracy massive movement. It was, it was it's not just in the center of Beijing, it's over 400 cities, some estimated over 150 million people in a prolonged protest in China. They, they, we didn't invent it, but we kind of coined this image as this occupation uh, uh, format of, uh, of a massive uh, uh, uprising and, uh, and potential a regime change, and it was again. It was it was a reform movement. It was a, a celebration. There's an atmosphere of celebration for this great hope, based on rising expectations throughout the 1980s. Were you when you describe that, and you describe the number of people who protested, not just in Beijing but across the country? I'm just curious. In a country where the state controls much of the information, where the state controls the media, how did the idea of this protest uh, ultimately come to fruition on that fateful day? In other words, how was that information passed on? How was the government perhaps not even aware that this was going to happen? And were you surprised ultimately by the numbers, the millions of people that turned up on that very day? Uh, the, the students uh, at the time in the 1980s had, we had many practices, so there's a lot of smaller movement and even in uh, two decades before that, since the end of what's known as the Cultural Revolution, uh, there, there are calls for greater freedom and political reform that's been building up, there's a leadership and experience building up and the students were, were, were quite organized and it was massive in, in Beijing before the rest of uh, the, the cities uh, and, and uh, so we joined. We had uh, 150,000 people. We were very well organized, uh, protests and demonstrations. It was it was a was a build up. But what the world failed to recognize, even today, is that it was a reform movement and it was extremely successful to the extent that the state media, the military leadership, even the top of the Communist Party, were openly agreeing with the demonstrators. Mm. There's a real collaboration between the reformers and the street theater. So that's why when the hardliners seeing their times is up, they throw a Hail Mary. And that's why they brought in such a, such a massive military force because what happened at, on the streets was known as a Tiananmen Massacre was only part of a political coup that the hardliners seized power uh, from the reformers and the China and the rest of the world have, uh, have a different past ever since. You know, at the time here in the U.S., there was sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this, right? And everyone remembers that iconic image, Tank Man. Um, but there were other iconic images from that, from the incident, but particularly Tank Man, I think everyone knows exactly what that means. Even if you don't know sort of the context, you know exactly what was happening at and that you know moment. know what it symbolizes. We had one of our correspondents, Elizabeth Palmer, who visited Tiananmen Square. She had to go there as a tourist. She couldn't go there openly as a journalist. And she showed photos, including that iconic photo of that man standing in front of the tank to other people there younger Chinese people, and they, some of them, didn't know what it was. They couldn't even tell her what country that took place in. You, ter, there was a tremendous amount of sacrifice that day, lives lost. When I say to you, some of your very own countrymen don't even know what country that took place in, how does that make you feel? Well, uh, as, as, a, uh, as, as a participant yeah. back then, uh, and uh, it saddens me, uh, that there is a collective amnesia driven by massive state-sponsored uh, forces to erase that part of our history. But as a China watcher and historian, as a perpetual optimist, and which you have to, to have to be when you're you're a social justice activist, uh, it doesn't really bother me that much because uh, history, like life, has its way to 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 stay in existence. And I tell you one thing, that right now in China, and this happened every year, June 3rd and June 4th, the last 29 years, uh, the, the top search 
by uh, the Chinese population, internet population, is Tiananmen. They don't get any images that we can see outside China, but they still search for it. So there is there is a emptiness, there's a hole that people are aware of and they're curious about. And and uh, from from my own experience in the late 1980s, we were cut off from early uh, memories of earlier. Movement, but as soon as the moment came, that's all reconnects, mm. and 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 that's not it's, it's because what what eighty nine shows uh, to China and to the world is that Chinese is just like anyone else. They don't just want rights; they want rights, right? They want human human dignity, not just a food and shelter. You know, Mr. Shen, uh, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but maybe our audience is not aware that uh, we don't know the identity of Tank Man. It's never been reliably proven who that individual was. We don't even know what happened to the crew that was in that tank, mm -hmm. which is really fascinating to me. And But what we do know is, as Anne-Marie pointed out, the Chinese government does not want these images shown or broadcast in China. And it is striking to me that to this day in 2019, the leaders in China fear what this represents. There is a, it still makes them squeamish to realize how close they came, how close the government came to collapsing in 1989. Am I right about that? Yes, so there's usually uh, it, the uh, interpretation of history, and then uh, when, when and Chinese uh, hardliners at the time, the, uh, the Chinese regime, that uh, wanted to interpret this image uh, in the meaning that is opposite from what we, the rest of the world, understand as it, the, the trump of human spirit. They put it out there and uh, it didn't work. So, uh, so just not, not just this particular tankman image, but the rest of uh, the, the, uh, the event. So they decided instead of trying to interpret in a way that's in this image, for example, in favor of the hardliner crackdown, which is that the military troops were, 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 were very careful not injuring uh, human lives, they pulled that image completely. So, uh, so they, they, the massive power in this, uh, in, in the Chinese historical memory about that year, the meaning is still unfolding. And uh, with uh, as powerful as the Chinese government today, they are very fearful about any whisper about that kind of a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous uh, demands for greater freedom. You know, you mentioned that there's a through line uh, between the Tiananmen uprising to today, and you talked about um, state-controlled um, capitalism, and that has given rise to a new wealthy class within China. There's social media, though it's you know heavily controlled. People can still sort of get on uh, social media and express themselves. I'm wondering, with um, you know what you might say is sort of a loosening, a little bit of a loosening from the Chinese government, whether or not you think the passion that led to that uprising 30 years ago is still present in China today or if you know some of these privileges have kind of diminished that flame well there's a political tightening uh, continuously uh, in the last 30 years so there's no uh, you know th 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 this, this is a duality or multifaceted of China uh, mm. economic development uh, massive urbanization you you, you, you don't you, you see the center of Shanghai or Beijing other major cities no different from other world capitals by the same time there's a there's a greater tightening of, of uh, uh, political control today but uh, again I'm not concerned about the uh, uh, another possible massive uprising because that happens spontaneously with or without uh, historical memory just like what happened to our generation 30 years ago what I am concerned about is that China missed an opportunity to transform on the political front peacefully we missed a chance so that energy once it once it happened because of the the, the, the massive corruption and uh, and uh, the cost of the last uh, three or four decades of economic development, including inequality, we may or may not do this peacefully. But I, you know, to that point, I guess, um, are you heartened by the future or not? Because we just saw uh, as early, as late as last year in Hong Kong, which enjoys greater freedoms than the mainland does, uh, China has promised to allow Hong Kong to remain sort of this entity that operates under the the norms that it did before it was handed back over to the Chinese government. Um, but they've become more and more stringent. They've cracked down a lot more on protesters. And there are a lot of people in Hong Kong who say, although I think the, 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 
the, um, the agreement is until 2047, before it reverts fully to Chinese control, that the Chinese government is already exerting a massive authority on the people there and on the, on the media. And so does that give you pause? Oh, yeah, no, I, uh, I think uh, the reform will not come from the current government, ah, unfortunately. It. Well, when it comes, uh, of course, you'll be more collaborative, like what we almost achieved back in 1989. What happened in Hong Kong, you're absolutely right. It's a very clear indication that uh, if it's up to Beijing, what will happen to China and their standing in the world. It's a very negative, uh, threatening factor in the, wor in the world stage. Right? And, and China, this is a challenge for China. China, Chinese government is really trying very hard to achieve what uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a self-image, which is a, a big country that matter, right? But without, without a balanced development, you will not achieve the kind of respect they're seeking. All right, Sheng Tong, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much.